Hi, well, thanks for joining me today. I am Eric Bjornstad. I am Technical Information Director with Bell Performance here in Central Florida. And today we're going to be covering and discussing issues and concepts centered on deposit and corrosion problems that typically are seen with the use of heavy fuel oil. Now, our goal is that by the conclusion of our discussion today, uh, you should be more familiar with how and when and why these, uh, you know, these, these heavy fuel oil related common problems uh, occur. So we want to cover the ins and outs of the deposits that form as a result of HFO use. We want to cover the ins and outs of both high and low temperature corrosion issues. We want to also talk about opacity problems. And we'll examine a couple of, categorically, a couple of the accepted solutions within the industry, along with making some distinctions between the dominant solutions, which are slurries versus oil-soluble magnesium treatment. So with those in mind, in order to talk about heavy fuel oil problems, we need to have an understanding of the combustion process. We need to understand uh, what are the processes that go on inside of a boiler unit. Now, the boiler, and this is, we, from the onset, we want to make a distinction that we are primarily going to be concentrating on boilers and furnaces here. Gas turbines have a little bit different issues. Categorically, they have a lot of the same issues, but there are other considerations for gas turbines. Now, I will say, and just keep this in mind if you have experience in the gas turbine arena, that a lot of the categorical problems when you're talking about corrosion issues and deposit formations, those, those are still inherent in the fuel oil used in gas turbines. Uh, you just have to have a different quality of a solution for those. So most of our focus is going to be on the boiler. Now, the boiler is the primary responsible unit uh, that converts the heating value of the heavy fuel oil into usable power, and it does it through the production of steam. And <clears throat> while this is being done, there are several processes going on in the boiler. Now, in this schematic, uh, we can see a, a cutaway of a boiler furnace. Uh, you have the heavy fuel oil being injected here by the oil gun, and it burns inside here, and the superheated air that's formed is then used to convert water that's circulating the heat transfer tubes and turns that water into steam. And that steam then will drive a turbine to produce electrical power. Meanwhile, you have the spent exhaust gas flows in this direction, it exits the furnace and eventually journeys, uh, makes its way through emission scrubbing equipment, which seeks to clean it up, and eventually will seek to lead the unit through the stack, hopefully a lot cleaner than it was before it got there. And so this area here, the cold, what they call the cold end, the lower temperature ends, these are the areas where you're going to have uh, to address the concerns about opacity and the concerns about fly ash issues. Now, while all of this is going on, you have also deposit and bottom ash being still being formed in here, uh, all in here, and you're always on the lookout as an operator for instances of hot and cold end corrosion in these areas. Given that corrosion and deposit formation are issues that operators have to deal with, let's look at each of these a little bit closer. Now, there are three primary influencers uh, in the formation, or three primary contributors, if you will, factors, uh, that play into the formation of boiler deposits and then corresponding corrosion issues. Now, like so many things in combustion chemistry, temperature has a significant influence. Uh, the composition of the substances in contact with metal surfaces and the nature of those surfaces, sure. Uh, definitely the compositions, uh, the, the, what makes up those substances, that definitely plays a key role because a composition determines what the deposits are made of and as you will see, the physical characteristics or the physical composition of those deposits definitely impacts the characteristics of, and the problems that those deposits may or may not uh, contribute to. And there's also, on more of a physics level, there's aerodynamic considerations. They come into play because they influence 
how the particles in the combustion gas stream behave as they leave that gas stream and they attach themselves to the metal surfaces in the boiler furnace. Now, um, this slide here, we see effective heating on minerals in fuel. What are we talking about here? Well, let's look at the first thing, the, the, the first factor that we talked about. Uh, it said uh, temperature of the metal and the gas stream. Now, from this illustration here, we see what basically what we're seeing is we're seeing what tends to happen at different temperature ranges within the boiler. Now, uh, what we can see from this, without going through all of these, what we can see is, first of all, that certain processes tend to happen at different temperatures. The important processes to consider are the oxidation processes, the oxidation temperatures of compounds like ferric sulfides and silicon oxides and aluminum oxides. We also want to pay attention to the temperatures that, that are most associated with the formation of SO2 gas and SO3 gas, which tends to be in here, between 400 and 800 degrees. Now, not only that, but you can have different kinds of solids form in different areas of the unit. So not only do different things happen at different temperatures, but in different areas of the unit, you can have different kinds of solids being formed as a result of fuel oil combustion. Now, in the furnace, you're a lot more likely to have liquid or semi-liquid deposits forming on those surfaces. This is because the temperature in the furnace, it, it's the highest, right? That's where the combustion is going on. And so if you have the highest temperature in here, that means that it's more likely that whatever inorganic deposits are being formed, they're more likely, the temperature in here is more likely to be above their, their eutectic and so they're going to be liquid or semi-liquid. Now, away from the furnace, you have the superheater area. The temperature is a little bit lower, so the deposits there are more likely to be semi-liquid instead of liquid. And then the economizer has even lower temperatures, which is why the deposits formed in that area, those tend to be characterized as dry particulate forms. Now, we've mentioned deposits here. What are the base processes for the formations of these kinds of deposits? Well, the general sequence can be broken down into relatively simple steps here. And of course, each of these steps, we, can, we could be as complicated as we want to dig, but we really don't intend to spend as much time as we could in venue doing that. And you don't necessarily need to know the absolute minute details of it. So we'll keep it a little bit high level here. Now, um, deposit formation has to start with the formation of a couple of basic oxides here, vanadate and sodium oxide. So VO5 or some other kind of vanadate, could be V2O3, could be V2O4, could be some other kind of complex. <clears throat> Uh, the, those, the vanadium oxides and sodium oxides are formed. That starts the process. Uh, the next thing that happens, uh, you have oxygen that comes from the air. Um, uh, excuse me, not the next thing. Uh, to, to explain how they're formed, they're formed because of the vanadium and sodium content of delivered by the fuel and then the oxygen coming from the air. Now, uh, I wanted to say, and the reason why I backed, I wanted to slip in that, that we should keep in mind that they are not, you know, sodium and vanadium oxides are not the only oxides that form during heavy fuel oil combustion. Heavy fuel oil has a lot of different kinds of metals inherent to its composition because it comes from petroleum. So you not, in addition to vanadium, in addition to sodium, you also have calcium, you have silicon, one, aluminum's a big one, you have iron, you have multiple different kinds of metals. And all of those metals will oxidize. And then they will, and those oxides will end up in one of two places. They will either be ending up in the bottom ash or in the fly ash, but they do have to go somewhere. So I didn't want to characterize it as the uh, vanadium and the sodium oxides are the only ones that are forming. So um, the next step that happens, the, the, the vanadium and sodium oxides have been formed. The next thing that happens is that other ash particles start sticking and building up on 
the surfaces that stop these. So they start attracting and providing a sticky substrate for other for additional ash to start building up. And while it's doing that, sodium actually acts as a binding agent to grab them and help them to form some complex kind of deposits there. Then after that's happened, the vanadium and the sodium, they actually chemically react on the metal surface and they form a liquid state deposit. And the liquid state then fluxes with the magnetite on the surface of the metal tube and that forms oxidation and corrosion and starts damaging the tube or the metal surface. That is the basic, in a nutshell, deposit formation. Here we can see an illustration of what, you know, whether you want to call it deposit formation or whether you want to call it tube fouling, basically the same thing. You see, you have here in the early stages, you have fine particles that are accumulating on the tube surfaces. And here, you're, you're not really concerned that much, unless you realize that it's going to go from here to here. Uh, these fine particulates, they accumulate on the tube surfaces, and they tend to form hard deposits. And these hard deposits then act as a substrate and a, a better surface for the further accumulation of more coarse ash. This causes the hard deposit to grow, as you can see. Meanwhile, while this is accumulating, getting bigger, growing larger, meanwhile, at the surface of the tube, you have a corrosion damage to the tube that's occurring. When you have a combination of these things here, now you have a fouled boiler tube, and you, as an operator, are not very happy right now. we mentioned, I said, you know, smaller particle size. We're talk, talking about small particles forming. Now, we mentioned particle size. We bring up particle size because particle size has a substantial influence on the mechanism, the method by which deposits will end up forming. Now, in this, in, in this illustration here, we can see a couple of things illustrated at the same time. Now, the y-axis here is how quickly, the rate at which the deposits are forming. This is in centimeters per second here. Um, so one centimeter per second to uh, 10 to 100. 100 centimeters per second would be pretty fast. Uh, here you have deposit rate, formation rate relative to particle size. Small particles versus large particles. And these are microns here. Now, basically what you can see here is you can see that when the particles are smallest, the deposit is forming fastest. The rate of deposit formation is higher. As the particles increase in size, the rate at which the deposit grows, it slows down. And that stands to reason. But once you get down to, you, you, you reach a nadir, a bottom part here, it bottoms out, and then it actually starts to go up. Now remember, deposits, the deposit sizes are, are they're, they're continually increasing, and suddenly we're back to the same kind of formation rate that we were when they were really small. Now why is this? Well, it could have something to do with the second thing that we noticed, that there are different mechanisms methods of deposit formation that come into play. Some of these methods are more closely associated with small particles versus large particles. And when the particles are smallest and the deposits are forming quickest around here, well, that's when uh, molecular diffusion tends to come into play. Um, here, when particles are larger, but they're still form deposits still forming at a rate similar to here, you have Brownian motion and you have turbulent diffusion and what they call inertial impaction. Those are causing uh, deposits to form. Now, uh, we could go into more detail on what each one of these is, but uh, honestly, it's probably not something you necessarily need to know. Your big, the big takeaway that you would want to take away from, from what you're seeing here is that particle size, and remember, this is inorganic oxide particles. Particle size has an impact on how quickly a deposit will form on metal surfaces in that. Particle size influences how quickly they form and by what mechanism, but we haven't said anything about 
the characteristics of those deposits, specifically the melting points of them. After all, you know, the deposit characteristics is what most directly informs any question or any speculation about whether those deposits will cause any problems or maybe they won't. Now here we can see that different combinations of ash, com ash components, we'll call them, different combinations can combine and yield substantially different melting point temperatures for that deposit. Now, going from lowest to highest, you have a vanadate that's got sodium in it, and we don't really need to go through what this is named, probably because I couldn't tell you what it's named right now, but the important thing here is that you can see its melting point is only 480 degrees. That means that, that this is very likely in almost any boiler to be in a liquid form. Now, if you add some additional sodium in there, you change it up, you've got 535. And as you go down the line, the melting point increases. The, the, the important one to look at is this last one here. All of these here were either vanadium oxides alone or sodium combined with vanadium oxides. But <clears throat> when you, when you uh, take magnesium and you add it into the mix, suddenly your melting point skyrockets to 1190 degrees. And this is important. This is a key distinction to keep in mind. All of this matters because the composition and the melting points of these different deposits directly impact their relationship on whether they're going to cause corrosion problems inside of that boiler. Now, this rather complicated map here, this illustrates that. What this seeks to illustrate is the relationship between the ratio of sodium and vanadium in the fuel oil and the melting temperature of the deposit that results from fuel oil with that ratio. It's kind of complicated, but we can point out a few things here. Now, what we can see here is that, uh, uh, and this is a weight ratio, keep in mind, we can see that at the low ratios, so there's a low amount of vanadium relative to sodium. In this area, as you're approaching a one to one, the deposits such as 3NA2OB05, they've actually got fairly high points. They're, you know, 1,050, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300 degrees. These are problem deposits, but as you start to increase, uh, more vanadium relative to sodium, and you start forming ones like 2Na2OB205. Notice that the only difference between this and this is that here there's one less sodium, which means it's a higher ratio. There's more vanadium relative to the sodium. What you see is that the temperature of those deposits formed drops dramatically. This is the area where the, the melting points of the deposits formed are low enough that you're going to have slagging and you're going to have significant corrosion problems. So uh, that is basically what this graph is telling us here. Now, we see that deposits with low melting point temperatures, they are more likely to be in the temperature zone. Now, <clears throat> one of the... Uh, one of the terminologies that you'll that you'll hear when you're when you uh, learn more about boiler deposits and what goes on inside of a furnace that uses the HFO or even coal is you'll hear this term sintering. Sintering, as you can see on your slide, sintering is the name used for the process in which the inorganic particles they come together, they agglomerate, and then they grow to form. It says to form a continuous solid phase, what we really mean is form a deposit. Sintering is the name of the problem. And the sintering process has three different stages. The initial process is when the particles begin to adhere, stick together, and they grow. Then intermediate is that what we call grains, grain growth, individual, um, now, shall we say, multi-particles within the deposit. They start to get bigger. And then the final one is the body has achieved 90 to 95 cent theoretical density. It's as large as it's going to get. Um, and it, it, the really the final stage in the sintering deposit is that the deposit itself actually starts to become more dense.
it might have had air pockets or what they called pores. Well, those pores and those pockets start to get filled in and it really starts to compress and it starts to become a lot denser. And so when that happens, you have full sintering achieved. Now, what are the things that affect the sintering process? Well, first and foremost is the chemical composition of the ash, which speaks to, of course, the chemical composition of the fuel oil itself. How, what was the vanadium and sodium level? What was the, uh, the ratio of other inorganics? That definitely in, impacts the sintering process. Also, uh, what they call time temperature history, a, a, a combustion chemist would probably look into that a little bit more detail. We don't really need to go into a lot of detail on that. Turbulence within the boiler, how the airflow moves within the boiler. That's something, that's something that the average operator might not think about, but the way air moves inside of a combustion area has a definite impact on whether problems are going to occur in that area. And then, of course, how long the ash particles or the time during which the ash particles are in contact on a heat transfer surface. That also affects the sintering process. Now, sintering, remember the first one, we talked about chemical composition. Here we talk about alkali. You know, sintering is most definitely influenced by the alkali content of the fuel that's being used. Here we can see how it's influenced. Um, alkali typically, Another name for sodium composition. Okay, so if we want to rename this, we might say that sintering is affected by the sodium content in the fuel. Now, um, why is sodium content? Why does that matter? Well, sodium content directly influences both the temperature at which sintering occurs and also the strength of the sintered fly ash. Now, when we say Sodium impact influences the temperature. What we mean is that if you have a higher sodium content, it makes sintering happen at lower temperatures, makes it happen sooner. In other words, levels of sodium are bad. And you can see that illustrated here. You have a number of different uh, uh, fuels here. And what you're looking at <clears throat> is you're looking at the strength of the sintered fly ash at one, uh, per 1,000 PSI. Basically, how hard, how strong is it? And in order to measure that, they had to take samples of it and they had to subject it to these pressures to be able to determine that. The other thing that you're charting it against is the temperature at which the sintering occurred. Now, what you can see is that when you had this blue one here, that's the low, that's the 9% alkali. This is the lowest sodium content. You can see that sintering happened at the highest temperature and it produced the weakest ash, less than 5,000 PSI. Start increasing the alkali content, and you can see pretty clearly that it, sintering happens at both a lower temperature and the, uh, the, the strength of those ashes markedly uh, uh, increases. <clears throat> so in other words, higher sodium content creates harder, denser ash that is more problematic. We mentioned sintering, you also hear about slagging. Slagging is a description of how deposits build up on tube surfaces. Now, basically you have fly ash particles. When the fly ash particles that are flying around in the air, that's why they're called fly ash, uh, they contain, they have, they're a mixture of whatever unburned carbon came from that fuel and the inorganic compounds that came from that fuel. The stuff like the sodium and the vanadium, the nickel, and the aluminum, and those have typically combined with oxygen. <clears throat> they've oxidized, so they're now the metallic oxides. They're ash particles. And they combine with the carbon. They formed this light fly ash that's flying around. Now, these fly ash particles, they will eventually hit these tubes, and they may start to stick. And when they start to stick, then they will start to build up. And you may, if you are unfortunate enough, you may eventually develop a slagging problem. Now, slagging problems can be influenced by things like the combustion conditions in the boiler, again, the fuel composition, of course, um, and even how the, the alloys in the composition of the metal in the heat transfer tubes themselves, that can also play a difference.
All of these things to one extent or another will affect the formation of slagging deposits. They'll affect the rate that they build up and they will affect how corrosive or they will influence how corrosive those slagging uh, deposits are. Now, with respect to fuel composition, remember when we talked about sintering, we were looking at sodium. Here, we're looking at vanadium. With respect to fuel composition, the vanadium content in the fuel is the thing that most directly impacts slagging problems. Now, the first thing we have to remember is that, of course, there are different vanadium or vanadate complexes that can be formed. There's V2O5, there's V2O4, and there's V2O3. Now, of those three, V2O5 is the one that is the problem one. And so, if you have a situation where a greater amount of V2O5 is formed relative to the formation of these others, that is a situation where you're going to have more problems. And the converse is also true. Now, what affects whether you're going to get a lot of V2O5? Well, the formation of that's dependent on the oxygen level in the boiler. And what you should be able to see is a pretty stark representation of data on that. Here, we have different fuel oils. And what it's looking at, it's looking at the vanadates that are formed. It's looking at the proportion of them that are V2O5 versus V2O3 and V2O4. And it's looking at those relative to the amount of oxygen. And what you can see, you should be able to see it pretty clearly here. At low levels of oxygen, when they're controlling, when they're minimizing the amount of oxygen present, they get a fairly small amount of V2O5 formed. It's in the blue. The red, which, is the good, which are the good ones, you get a higher proportion of those formed. Life's good here. But if they find that they need to start increasing excess air because maybe they're not getting proper combustion, so that they increase excess air, or maybe they're trying to control to keep the, the exhaust gas stream above the dew point because they're, they're having corrosion problems. So they have to increase air. Unfortunately, what that's going to do is once they get above three and a half and they get to four and five, suddenly, boom, they're getting a lot more of this problematic B2O5 vanadate that are being formed. So they're trying to minimize one problem and unfortunately, they only create another problem at the same time. So a low level of, 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 of excess oxygen will decrease or minimize the formation of V2O5, and thus it will decrease the problems of deposits forming that have a low melting point. Of course, just saying, oh, we're going to keep the, uh, the oxygen low, well, it's not that simple because if your oxygen is kept uh, artificially low, that can lead to other problems in itself. Namely, it can directly impact uh, the complete of combustion. Now, what kind of problems do these slagging or slag deposits contribute to? Well, you know, this is a nice illustration here of some typical slag deposits. And the list of problems will take, <laughs> will take several slides to go through. I mean, it lowers heat transfer, causing, you know, insulates the tubes and affects how efficiently the heat is transferred into the water behind them. Um, it contributes to high temperature corrosion. It helps catalyze or increase the formation of sulfur trioxide, which is what leads to sulfuric acid and cold end corrosion later on. It increases the maintenance cost because the tubes are harder to clean and they'll have to be maintained and cleaned and replaced more often. Um, all of this means you can have a loss of product production uh, because you have to shut the boiler down more often to clean it. And shutting down is definitely not something that you ever really need to do. Now, here we have an illustration of a typical black, what we would call a melted sticky ash. This is a low temperature ash formation. Melting point's only 600 degrees. And since the boiler uh, and probably the superheater areas are typically operate at temperatures higher than that, that means that this ash is most likely all going to be in this semi-liquid state. And when it is the semi-liquid state, that means it's sticky, it sticks to surfaces and it provides an excellent sticky surface for other things to stick to it. Now compare that to an ash with a higher melting point. 
600 degrees was this one. This one's a 900 degree one. And it's called a dry ash. And it has been formed by introducing a magnesium treatment into that heavy fuel oil. This dry, what they call friable ash, so it has a higher melting point, which means it is much less likely to be semi-liquid in any area of, of the furnace. Uh, the composition is drier, it's more powdery, and it's more likely to not only prevent other things from sticking to it, so it doesn't grow as large as quickly, but it's also more likely to fall off on its own, meaning that the boilers easier to clean some other boiler deposits, some other pictorial examples of some ones that we have seen uh, over the years. Uh, we'll not give the names of where these are found because, uh, you know, we want to change the names to protect the innocent, so to speak. But uh, th this is how some other boiler deposits might look. These are how heater deposits might look. Now, this here, this is a before versus after picture. Uh, we'll get to the after here in a minute, but really we wanted to, to highlight this and that these are some typical superheater deposits. And these are typical front water wall deposits. Again, this is a before and after. This was before. You have all these deposits on the front water walls. And then they kind of magnesium treatment and actually helped clean those up. And so the after's looking a lot, lot better. So that's Deposits. That's deposit slagging, sintering, foul problems inside of a boiler. <laughs> Let's talk about corrosion. Now, one of the reasons that we have been talking about deposits is because deposit characteristics are actually one of the influencing factors on corrosion in the boiler system. And we mean both high temperature and low temperature corrosion. So that's not the first time that we said that. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what the characteristics of each are. Now, high temperature corrosion tends to happen above 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It tends to happen in, in the, the, the hotter areas, hence the term high temperature. So it tends to happen places like the wall, the furnace wall tubes, superheaters and the reheaters, and the economizers. Now, below 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when you get low temperature corrosion. And that tends to happen in the cooler areas of the unit that where their temperatures are below 1,000 degrees. Places like the air heaters, the economizers, and very much in the stack, the last part of the system before the exhaust gas and the emissions gases go out into the outside. Now, what factors influence corrosion? Well, we already talked about the composition and the condition. We say composition and condition of salt. What we, what we really mean is composition of the deposit. Uh, fluid gas velocity, fluid gas composition, oil composition. That means uh, fuel oil composition. How much sodium, how much vanadium, how much iron, how much inorganics does it have in it, how much sulfur. Um, and also, you can influence corrosion by the way that you run or operate the furnace. So temperature and temperature cycling phenomenon. Those can also influence uh, corrosion. Now, let's uh, also consider uh, alloy composition. Boiler design helps, um, you know, whether the alloys, whether the metals of the, 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 uh, the, the metals of the tubes and the alloys in those tubes are pre-treated with something to help protect them. All of those things are factors that can positively or negatively influence any corrosion problem that you're going to have. We said high temperature or hot corrosion and low temperature or cold corrosion. Let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. So let's start with the hot corrosion. Now, on the boiler tubes inside the furnace, which is typically the hottest area in the system, boiler tubes will typically have some kind of deposit on their surface. And um, if that deposit is a problematic one, then what you may end up having is you may end up having some kind of liquid interface develop between the tube and the deposit itself. Now, when this happens, what you'll actually get is you'll get an exchange of electrons that happens between the metallic alloys at the surface and the materials 
between the uh, the excuse me the materials in the deposit, and uh, so these electrons are fed uh, through the interface, and that is what accelerates corrosion. What accelerates uh, corrosion are the impurities in the deposit itself. Now, this corrosion will attack and it will destroy the protective chrome iron oxide layer that is normally found on the surface of the tubes. And if it destroys that protective layer, then that tube is a lot more uh, prone to corrosion issues. So the impurities in the deposit are what accelerate this process. So the impurities, they lower the melting point of this, this, this chrome iron layer and help cause accelerated corrosion through some kind of pitting mechanism. And this can be dangerous because if this gets serious enough, it's, it weakens the surface of the tube and it could lead to tube explosion. If you've been around in the industry long enough, you will have seen it yourself or heard another place that had some kind of tube explosion problem because the tubes got unduly damaged by hot corrosion. So this is basically how hot corrosion works. And again, it's called hot corrosion because it's occurring in the furnace in the area of temperature. You can see a couple of examples. Now, um, this is a before treatment. This, you can see corros corrosion damage to metal surfaces here. You can see some excellent examples of pitting damage that happened. This, these are the same tubes after they did extended treatment with a magnesium treatment. You can see that the tubes basically kind of repaired themselves. And that's basically what you want to see because if you can get, you can remove deposits, if you can help uh, remediate this kind of damage uh, by adding something to the fuel oil without having to shut down, that is your best case scenario. That's what you want to do. So slagging is essentially, is probably uh, linked to hot corrosion problems. Hence, if we solve a slagging problem, we can put a significant dent in the hot corrosion problem. Well, how do you solve problems with slagging? Well, recall that slagging happens primarily in deposits that have low melting points. They have, they have low melting temperatures, they're sticky, they build up on the furnace walls more easily, and this is due to the fact that their composition is usually something like this. They may be 205, or there's some combination of a sodium and vanadium complex, and they have low melting points, 480, 535, 675. If you can add this kind of magnesium to them, you can change their melting points, increase them dramatically, and suddenly you may have found your solution to the slagging problem. And that's basically what it is. You add a magnesium-based additive to the fuel oil, it changes the composition of the resulting deposits, which changes their physical characteristics in a number of desirable ways, not the least of which is much higher points. Now, magnesium treatments. From basic chemistry, we know that magnesium around since the mid-18th century, 1755, it is extremely abundant in the Earth's, uh, in the Earth state, most abundant element. Um, and it has been used, magnesium oxide has been used in power generation applications to help assist with the very problems we've been talking about since the 1950s. Uh, it is a tried and true solution. It has really uh, a good and positive effects on deposits, on heat transfer issues. It helps fix both high temperature corrosion and low temperature corrosion. It helps with opacity, helps with maintenance. Magnesium is, I mean, the reason why it's still around since the 1950s is because it does what they need it to do. Now, how does it work? Well, this is a diagram. Again, whether you want to say it's a poor diagram or not, that's up to you. But this is a diagram or an illustration of vanadium oxide formations that are being surrounded by magnesium that is deliver, being delivered into the fuel oil by some kind of additive from the outside. So you have vanadium, you have oxygen. So this here is V2O5. And then these are the magnesium particles. And this one's V2O4, this one's V2O3. Now, 
happens is that when the magnesium is introduced, the magnesium actually binds to some of the oxygen. So it binds, so this magnesium stole this oxygen. It took it away from the vanadate. So what do you think happened? Well, what happened is that those vanadium, uh, those vanadates are now changed. This one went from B2O5 to B2O4. Remember that B2O4 has a higher melting point than B2O5 does. This one was attacked by two magnesiums and had two uh, oxygen stolen. Suddenly, it went from B2O5 to B2O3. And this one was B2O4. It got oxidized to B2O3. And so what basically ended up is that you get uh, the vanadates are changed. And also, these magnesiums now are magnesium oxides. And they may form together, and they may start to form complexes like this, you know, 3MgO-V2O5 type thing. Basically, what happens is that the resulting combination of magnesium and oxygen, the resulting combination of what was in the deposit and what is now in the deposit, the temperature, it's not 550 degrees anymore. It might be 1,200 degrees. And that is a significant increase. Significant mean really, really important and beneficial for the, 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 the furnace that's having slagging and corrosion problems. So as you can see here, this is, these are tubes uh, that are in an uh, HFO burning plant. And before, they had a you know, pretty substantial uh, deposit problem. Over six months, they used or added magnesium to their HFO. And what you can see is three months in, some of these deposits have actually started to fall off. These tubes are far sight cleaner than these tubes are. And then six months in, you can see that those tubes are about as clean as they're going to get. So the takeaway here is that, first of all, magnesium actually attacked the de existing deposits and helped change them in such a way that they fell off, that they essentially cleaned themselves up by themselves. The second takeaway is that it's not an instantaneous process, that plant that's having uh, the deposit issues will need to plan to take three to six months to help clean them up. Now, you might say, well, three to six months, you know, that's too long. We can't wait that long. Well, the flip side to that is that, yeah, it's going to take six months to clean up, but it's six months where you're still operating normally. You do not have to shut down your plant to do this, and that is a big, big deal. Now, talked about, we talked about corrosion. We haven't really said anything about emissions. So let's talk about SO2. Let's talk about uh, sulfur dioxide and boiler emissions. Now, remember, everything that's in the fuel, that was in the fuel oil has to go somewhere. The carbon is what's being burned and turned into heat energy. Um, the inorganic metals are what's forming the fly ash and the bottom ash. But where's the sulfur going? The fuel, the fuel oil contains elemental sulfur. Um, once that sulfur you know, enters into the combustion process, it is going to react with oxygen and it is going to form sulfur dioxide gas. Now, in itself, sulfur dioxide does not really cause a problem. What causes a problem is when we get some further reactions that happen to it. Now, a percentage of that SO2 will further combine with additional oxygen and form SO3. And this is the one that's of more interest to us. Um, uh, this, this, this further reaction of, of SO2 to SO3, that can either happen uh, by just a natural direct reaction, like some of it's going to happen anyway, or it can happen if it comes into contact with some kind of catalyst. And the kind of catalysts that we're thinking of are some kind of iron oxide, some kind of vanadium, like a vanadium pentoxide, V2O5, or some other kind of metal like nickel. Now, what stands out with those three? What should stand out is that those three things are all things 
that are present in the fuel oil and therefore will be to present in things like, let's say, some of those deposits that are hanging around on those boiler tubes. So the presence of those deposits catalytically increases the amount of SO3 that is formed. And that is a problem because basically SO3, you have SO3 leaving the stack and going down you know, towards the exhaust system. Eventually, it will combine with water vapor and it will form sulfuric acid. And that, will, that is what causes the cold end corrosion that you keep hearing about. Now, here, what we can see is we can see some distinct differences in the amount of SO2 that's oxidized to SO3. Uh, and we can see it in terms of the percentage of, of this happening at a specific temperature. And we can see that how this percentage or how this graph varies when you start to add in the presence of some different metallic oxides. Now, remember, you might not have seen this on the previous slide. Only a certain amount of the SO2 naturally converts to SO3, only maybe 1% to 5%. And you start doing things like you start adding in the presence of catalytic metals that you start getting a higher set of oxidized. So what can we see here? Well, we can see temperature down here, and then uh, percent of SO2 that's oxidized, or ppm of, of SO2 that's oxidized. I'm not exactly sure if it's ppm or percentage, but the basic point gets illustrated here. Now, what you can see, this red line here, red line with the square, is just standard V2O5. V2O5 causes problems in and of itself, but we'll use it as a, ba as a base. And as you can see, that as you start to get up to uh, temperatures of around, let's say, 550 degrees, you get a peak amount of around 60% 60 60 or 60 ppm. And then actually, as you increase the temperature, the, the amount goes down. This exact same bell curve is followed by these other uh, 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 metallic ones as well. If you start adding in a small amount of sodium, you actually get less, which is a little bit surprising. But if you start adding in a little bit of a little bit of, of of sodium, a little bit of nickel presence, a little bit of iron, um, you can actually get higher. Um, the point here is that uh, exposure to these kinds of metals does can influence or increase the amount of SO2 that's uh, oxidized to SO3, and just as importantly, the temperature at which this is happening. So, when we consider that the different factors that influence the formation of SO3, um, the fourth one, the catalytic, the presence of catalytic compounds, you can just see is definitely something that influences it. So, the sulfur content of the fuel, the combustion process itself, and the temperature and the pressure conditions inside of the, the, the combustion zone. And then, the presence of catalytic compounds. All four of those things can impact the formation of SO3. Now, there is a reason why we, there's a reason why we're talking about this. There's a reason why we have to spend a little bit of special time considering this, and that is because sulfur trioxide causes specific problems, special problems that make it worth worrying about. Now, in most combustion systems, um, blue gas temperatures typically will range. Um, if it's in the flame, you're talking 1,600 degrees centigrade. If you're in the stack, you can be down to as low as 120 degrees centigrade. Now, this temperature change, uh, you know, the, 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 change, the difference between 1,600 and 120, uh, this can cause a number of different chemical and physical changes in the flue gas components. And among the most troublesome change is the reaction between sulfur trioxide and existing water vapor. When those two things condense, when they combine, you get sulfuric acid formation. This happens as the flue gas cools, as it leaves the combustion zone, travels through the economizer, travels down towards the stack, it's cooling down. As it's cooling down, there's vapor phase sulfuric acid that's forming. 
And if that vapor contacts a relatively cool surface, it will condense onto that surface as liquid sulfuric acid. Uh, and that's when you get cold and corrosion that happens. Um, the temperature at which sulfuric acid first condenses, you know, what temperature does this happen? Well, it can, it can be, you know, anywhere around, you know, 160 degrees centigrade. Uh, the amount or the, the specific temperature depends on the con sulfur trioxide content and the amount of water vapor concentration in the flue gas. So the quantity of SO3, the amount of SO3 available, and the amount of moisture in the flue gas, both of those can affect the temperature at which this dew point is reached. Now, acid point, um, uh, uh, operators, uh, furnace op or, or plant operators are very concerned about dew point. Um, acid dew point specifically, that's the temperature at which the acid condenses from the gas stream onto the metal surfaces. Um, operators do not want this to happen. An operator wants to keep exhaust gas temperatures above the dew point temperature as much as possible because if they can do that, they can keep this condensation from happening. Now, the acid dew point temperature, as we were just saying a minute ago, that exact te specific temperature for the specific plant depends on certain things, like the amount of water vapor that's in the, in, in the flue gas. The more water vapor you have in there, the higher the dew point, the higher the acid dew point temperature. Now, uh, just me saying that may not mean that much to you. So, what, what we want to reiterate is that you would like to have a low acid dew point uh, as much as possible because the, the, the lower the dew point you have, the less condensation that you're going to have. I mean, think about it this way. Um, think about that, let's say that you have two situations. One has a dew point of 150 degrees and the other one has a dew point of 110 degrees. And you have a gas stream going, and that gas stream is start. The gas stream is starting at high temperature, and then it's cooling down. Um, let's say the gas temperature starts at 200 degrees. If the dew point in actuality is 150, that gas only has to cool down 50 degrees before that sulfuric acid vapor condenses out, and boom, you've got problems. If it was 110 degrees then that gas would have to cool down not 50, but 90 degrees. It would, and that would give the operator a lot more margin to be able to try and make that, that exhaust gas get out of the system without giving up uh, the, the sulfuric, condensed sulfuric acid and having the, uh, the, the low temperature corrosion that goes along with it. Now, this, uh, excuse me, I have to sneeze here. Okay, excuse me. Like I said, sometimes you got to sneeze. Well, what, what this illustrates here, this illustrates the point we were saying a minute ago, which is that dew point depends on um, the amount of water vapor that's present and also the amount of SO3, the amount of, 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 of sulfur component that's in it. And what you can see is that at lower concentration, um, and low amounts of sulfur, the dew point is fairly low, 190. The more SO3 you get in that concentration, the higher the dew point raises, and you do not want to be up here, you want to be down here. And the relationship is basically the same for the high water vapor, the temperatures just moved a little bit. So you should be able to see that there is a difference between um, uh, dew point temperatures in situations where you have a lot of SO3 gas and you have a lot of water vapor that's present. Uh, what here uh, is that uh, the amount of sulfur trioxide produced really increases alongside increases in the level of excess air, the gas residence time, the temperature of the gas, the amount of catalysts, remember the metal catalysts, the amount of those that are present, and the sulfur level of, of the fuel. Those four or five things are what influence the formation of SO3. Now, excess air, that determines the amount of oxygen that's available in order to oxidize SO2 to SO3. So oxygen is important there. 
Longer residence time means basically how long is that gas hanging around? The longer it hangs around, the more likely it is to eventually oxidize. Temperatures. High, if you have higher temperatures in there, you have more energy that's available to drive the reaction. And then, of course, we saw on the previous slide, if you have nickel or we have some kind of vanadium or iron oxide present, that will catalytically increase the amount of SO3 that's formed. Um, another thing to note is that dew points only marginally influenced when the fuel sulfur concentration goes above 0.5 or 5,000 ppm. So what you see in this graph here is you see a relationship between the flue gas, dew, the dew point temperature of the flue gas on the y-axis here and the sulfur content of the fuel. And what you can see is that uh, below a half of a percent, that's when you get the largest rise. Once you get above a half a percent, it's still going up, but at a very slow rate. So the area that we would be most concerned about when we're talking about sulfur content influencing the formation of SO3. Now, all these factors, all these factors influence this problem of corrosion, and they're all issues that the operator needs to balance along with the need for maximum combustion efficiency. I mean, I mean, you know, let's face it. His job is to try and, and burn that fuel to make electricity and to do it as efficiently as possible. And unfortunately, when he tries to do it as efficiently as possible, he gets high temperature problems and he gets low temperature problems here. So we've already been kind of introducing the, uh, the, the, the building block, the building block factors for low temperature corrosion. Low, then, low temperature or what they call cold end corrosion, it occurs whenever the temperature of the metal surface drops below the dew point of the sulfuric acid of uh, flue gas. Now, most problems caused by cold end corrosion, they occur in uh, the, 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 the boiler areas where the temperatures are lower, the economizer and the air preheater and the, uh, you know, you have, you can have corrosion problems in the induced draft fan. You can have corrosion problems in the flue gas scrubbers. And of course, you can have corrosion problems in the stack. So corrosion occurs whenever the metal temperatures are below the dew point. Um, typically, when you have cold end corrosion, when you're looking for it, what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, what, what they would talk about. You're going to see metal loss that is smooth, what they, they might say generalized, so it's not pitting necessarily. It's general, smooth, featureless metal loss. Sometimes you might see some rust-colored surfaces, but typically general smooth featureless metal loss is what you're typically going to see. So um, let's consider now uh, typical rates of corrosion. How quickly does it happen? What's the rate of corrosion in the cold end? Well, here, what we can see, we can see a relationship between the rate of corrosion, how quickly it happens in the typical boiler system, and you can see it relates to temperature, both relative to low and high oxygen. Now, what you see is that the corrosion rate usually peaks about 20 to 50 degrees C below the acid dew point. Uh, and the reason this is, is because the amount and the concentration of the acid condensate, that's the, the, the area in which uh, they, they have reached the most favorable mixture for that corrosion to occur. Now, at lower temperatures, getting down here, at lower temperatures, the water vapor condenses. And what that means is you get a larger amount of weak acid that's produced. But now when we say weak acid, we don't mean it's not corrosive. It is highly corrosive. But at the lower temperatures, when you get the largest amounts of weak but highly corrosive acid produced. Um, the condensate that comes out, it contains both acid, it also contains dissolved SO2, and it also contains dissolved CO2. And both of those are also aggressive in attacking metal surfaces. So what are the best ways to minimize low temperature corrosion? What can you do about it? Well, um, you know, we can go through these. Some of them are 
self-evident, but let's talk about each of these. Um, number one, try to use as little O2 levels as possible. The less oxygen that you have supplied, the less chance you have of SO2 oxidizing to SO3. You can try to use fuel with lower sulfur content. Unfortunately, that's not always possible for most users, but theoretically, that's something that do. You want to minimize the amount of moisture in the flue gases, because again, uh, sulfuric acid formation needs not only SO3, but it needs water vapor. So if you can minimize moisture in the flue gases, you can help to prevent corrosion. You want to minimize your ash deposits, the catalytic ash deposits that help promote greater uh, transition of SO2 to SO3. And of course, you can use magnesium-based additives. Let's take a closer look at this last option. Again, we've mentioned it before. The use of magnesium-based fuel treatments has been around in the industry literally since the 1950s. Bell Performance actually formulated our first ATX uh, magnesium formulation in the 1970s. Before that, we were manufacturing uh, 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 detergent surfactant packages uh, to try and control sludge, in, and a lot of people use those in the 50s. But the 1970s is when we started adding magnesium and creating these multifunction uh, magnesium treatments for heavy fuel oil. Now here, we can see data relating to rate of production of SO3 on the y-axis, and that's relative to the flue gas temperature. And what we can see is that we can see it, uh, a, we can see a comparison of unadditized fuel in the red and fuel, heavy fuel oil that's additized with ATX in the blue. And what you can see is you can see that there's a significant difference in the amount of SO3 that was produced at lower temperatures. As the temperatures increase, the lines may converge, but there's still a significant amount. So treating heavy fuel oil with ATX, with the magnesium in ATX, at 100 degrees flue gas temperature, you can get essentially, uh, you know, five and a half into three. You're looking at a, you know, what, what 80% or whatever, a big substantial difference in the amount of SO3 that's formed. And that's going to mean a substantial reduction in corrosion problems. We also see a difference in uh, how uh, magnesium matters, like how they affect uh, this problem, but in different forms. Here we start looking at the difference between how magnesium oxide slurries work and how the oil soluble magnesium in ATX works by looking again at SO3 emissions, this time relative to power production in a typical plant. And what you can see is that you can see the blue is the ATX and the magnesium slurry is the orange. And you can see that at virtually all temperatures, there's significantly less SO3 that's formed through when using oil soluble magnesium versus uh, magnesium oxide slurries that are not soluble in the fuel. So the evidence is pretty clear that using magnesium uh, additives like ATX, they make a significant difference in lowering acid production and solving corrosion problems. And the, da the data is also clear, equally clear, that an oil soluble form of magnesium works better than a magnesium oxide slurry does. Now, here you can see an example of low temperature corrosion. Um, this, this was a, uh, uh, an economizer. You can see that there's significant corrosion damage and that was simply caused by, over time, condensation of uh, the sulfuric acid onto this, uh, on, onto this piece of equipment. So this is gonna have to be replaced. Um, and it happened, uh, because it happened in the economizer area, we know that it happened when the surface temperature of this metal was below 150 degrees. So it was below the likely dew point for that particular stream. As we've shown earlier, you have the magnesium in ATX. It reacts with SO3 that had been formed, and it, what it does is it neutralizes it and turns it into harmless magnesium sulfate. 
Now, one of the benefits here, one of the good things, not only is it attacking corrosion, but it's also going to help the operator reduce excess air. Because ATX, not only does ATX contain magnesium, it also contains some organometallic combustion catalysts. And so they help the operator get actually the same combustion level that they did before, but with a lower oxygen level having to be supplied. And this is very important because if you can get the same amount of combustion with less oxygen being supplied, that means you're going to have less SO2 being oxidized to SO3. That's really going to help your corrosion problem. And of course, again, because ATX contains magnesium, that magnesium is going to, as we discussed earlier, it's going to change the melting point of the ash particles. It's going to dry them out. It's going to make the deposits more friable, more likely to fall off. Now, the chemistry behind the action of the magnesium in ATX can be illustrated here. See, what happens is that the sulfur from the fuel in the fuel oil combines with oxygen, forms SO2. Um, a certain amount of that will react with additional oxygen to form SO3. Now, at this point, if you did not have ATX, what would happen is this SO3 would hang around for as long as it wanted to. It would eventually combine with water and it would form corrosive H2SO4 vapor and cause exactly the same kind of damage that you saw in that economizer. But if you've got heavy fuel oil that's treated with ATX, then that, the magnesium in that ATX will combine with the SO3 and it will form magnesium sulfate, which unlike sulfuric acid, this is not corrosive, this is corrosive. This is good, this one very bad. So through this mechanism, ATX neutralizes corrosion problems. Now, what about opacity? Opacity is what we mentioned in the first slide. We said we were going to look at a little bit like this. Opacity is a big, big deal for operators. Why is it such a big deal? Is it because it destroys equipment? Well, no, not, not necessarily. <clears throat> Does it mean that it destroys uh, um, efficiency? Well, no, not, not necessarily. Opacity is a visible sign to the outside that makes people think that the plant's dirty. And in this day and age, in power generation, uh, you know, with the with the 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 environment that we're living in, uh, you do public perception is everything for power generation and for fuel oil users. And if they have a bunch of stuff, visible stuff coming out of that stack. They are, they are going to get a call from the community, and they are not going to like it. So opacity, which is illustrated here, this is a nice picture of a typical opacity issue. Uh, opacity is an optical effect, and what it indicates is that you have a combination of SO3 and water vapor leaving the stack. Now, typically, if a boiler unit is or a furnace unit is dirty, it will tend to have more issues with opacity than clean units have. And if you have to use high excess air, if you combine it with uh, you know, vanadium deposits that are pre-existing, well, that will also make it more likely for a unit to have visible opacity problems. So opacity is caused by the condensation and the presence of SO3 and so acid. It occurs at uh, SO3 levels greater than 5 ppm. Um, we already said dirty units have more problems with opacity than clean ones, and units that have a high level of excess air will tend to also have more problems. So you tip edge opacity by using some kind of um, a certified reader that takes uh, readings from a point below the stack. Now, um, uh, usually it's, this is an automated machine that's uh, situated in there. Um, and depending on where you measure it, you can get differences in uh, the, uh, uh, the opacity readings. Now, an opacity, measure, an opacity measurement measuring device will typically look something like this. Well, not exactly like this, but this is the schematic of what it looks like. Um, it has a light source that emits light typically around 850 nanometers, and there's a detector that's situated on the opposite side of the stack. 
And as the gas moves through, as the plume gas moves through, the light is transmitted through it, and then it is measured on the other side, and they see what the difference is. And the difference between that, that is what is measured or counted as opacity. Now, opacity measurement dependent on particle size. What we didn't really measure, mention before is that opacity is also contributed to by the presence of particulates. And uh, smaller particulates influence opacity just as much as large ones. In fact, the smallest particles actually have the largest effect on visible opacity. Um, you know, when we say smallest, we're talking about uh, in, in between two and eight tenths of a micron. They have the highest influence on opacity. Now, other particles can still influence it, but these have the highest. Um, that being said, the biggest single influencer on visible opacity is the presence of sulfuric acid. Now, as you recall, sulfuric acid forms according to a simple mechanism. You have SO3 in the flue gas, typically is in equilibrium with the SO2, um, but it's temperature sensitive. And if you get uh, the wrong temperature, then it will oxidize and it will combine with water vapor and it will form uh, H2SO4. And then these, this acid vapor will condense, it will form small droplets um, and which increase the amount of small particulates that are in the flue gas. This acid then will condense onto the carbon particulates that we were talking about and will actually make them a little bit larger. So the presence of uric acid and the presence of particulates, those two things together result in a visible opacity problem. So acid condensation on existing small particulates, um, it increases the diameter of those particulates and causes a higher uh, opacity. So opacity is a phenomenon that plant operators really want to avoid whenever possible. Fortunately, if they use ATX, well, the ATX formulation can do a number of specific things to help reduce potential opacity problems. Well, what are they? Well, uh, opacity is related to the presence of acid droplets and carbon particulates. Then one way you can help solve opacity problems is to reduce acid production and eliminate particulate production. And ATX contains ingredients to help do both things. The magnesium containing components help minimize the formation of acids and just as importantly, the uh, organometallic combustion catalysts in ATX uh, cause uh, a reduction in the formation of carbon particulates. So you have fewer carbon particulates because of that carbon's burning as it's supposed to. So you get less sulfur gas, you get less particulates, you get a reduction in opacity, and all is right with the world for that uh, plant operator. So we've talked about a lot of things here. Um, we've, talk, we've mentioned a, a lot of different problems that have different moving parts that the plant operator has to take into account. So how does that plant operator choose the right treatment? You know, they're going to know if they have a problem. None of this is news to a plant operator. They already know this stuff. But how do they choose the right treatment to try and eliminate these problems? Well. With all of the considerations that the operator needs to balance, it's really important for that operator to choose the right kind of treatment to address these problems. They want something that's going to address SO3 levels. They want something that's going to positively impact their fly ash. And what we mean positively impact it is reduce the amount of carbon that's in it. Um, Typically, they will also uh, they also want one that's got a proven record. When we say uh, previous experiences, what we mean is that one that is built on technology that's been proven to work. And they need to consider their boiler condition as well. Uh, by boiler condition, um, if their boiler is uh, really in need of being cleaning, in being cleaned, then ATX will definitely 
help them with that. They also want to consider the amount of excess hair they're using, slag, the, the mount, mountain and nature slag uh, formations. Uh, they're going to want to uh, consider the the sodium, phosphorus, and vanadium content of their fuel, and their deposit analyzation. Uh, and, and, uh, now, the operator, when he's seeking solutions, he's going to come across two main categories of boiler treatments. He's going to come across uh, magnesium slurry, and he's going to come across an oil-soluble magnesium option. Uh, what kind of considerations is he going to have to take into account for this? Well, in order for him to make the right choice, he does need to be familiar with the pros and cons. Now, start by looking at slurry. Slurry, the old school solution. They have been in use for decades. They are really inexpensive because magnesium oxide itself is one of the simplest uh, things to make in the chemistry world. So they're cheap, they're easy to get, they've been around for a long time. However, they have a big drawback in that they cause wear and tear uh, in the injection system. The magnesium oxide particles are abrasive. And if you get a slurry, if you get a suspension of them, all being forced through this, this nozzle and through these holes, then if they don't plug up the holes, um, they're going to cause wear. And they're going to actually wear and change the shape of these holes to more of a spherical shape. And what? And keep in mind that this nozzle, this isn't just a nozzle to inject magnesium oxide into the flame front. This is a nozzle that's injecting fuel oil that has magnesium oxide already added to it. So if the nozzle, if the HFO injection nozzle looks like this, it's not going to be able to properly uh, inject or optimally inject the HFO into the flame front, and that's going to affect the performance of the plant. Um, there's also a difference in how slurries work when they act or interact with the deposits. Now, um, typically what happens when a slurry comes in contact with a, an existing deposit is that the slurry is going to want to build a an insulating deposit on top of that sodium vanadate. Problem is that if you uh, get too much of a, a uh, an insulating deposit, you can get what's called the whitening effect, and that will affect uh, the that will overly insulate the tube, um, and that's going to cause real problems for performance inside the boiler. Uh, by and large, magnesium oxide deposits don't, re uh, excuse me, magnesium oxide or mag ox additives don't really have a meaningful effect on existing deposits. And that is a key distinction between magnesium oxide slurries and oil soluble slurries like ATX. Oil soluble slurries do things that magnesium oxide, uh, magnesium oxide can't, namely, they can penetrate existing deposits like this, and they can actually change their composition and cause them to fall off and be removed. So the plant, as you saw with those, with those pictures from earlier, the plant that has an existing deposit problem can use an oil-soluble magnesium treatment, not have to shut down operation, and they will clean out their, their system over time without having to shut it down, which is a big, big advantage for them. Now, we, we, we wanted to write the whole thing about whitening. Now, um, whitening is the phenomenon that happens with slurry. Whitening refers to when you get boiler surfaces that are covered with this, this layer of white particles, hence why it's called whitening. And it's got a couple of negatives. Um, first thing it does is that it impairs the heat transfer, which affects the efficiency. And it can also have a pro cause a problem where it causes a problem in the superheater areas where it actually causes the superheaters to become overheated. So whitening is, is, is a negative phenomenon that uh, plant operators really want to avoid. Luckily, the oil-soluble magnesium in ATX does not have any whitening effect problems whatsoever. 
see in a tube that's been treated with magnesium oxide slurry it's got a it's 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 got a a a, a, a whitening layer here and that whitening layer not only does it affect the way heat moves in and out but it also reflects radiant heat from the outside back that's the problem that happens in the superheater but if if that user is using oil soluble magnesium in atx this deposit is removed there's no whitening deposit the radiant heat from the outside actually uh, 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 has the proper heat exchange from inside to outside and it's reflected back by a clean surface much more advantageous uh, condition for that system uh, the last big problem with slurries is that you can have dosing difficulties you know magnesium oxide slurries typically have to have their own tank because they are a slurry they add the particles are just in suspension in this liquid and they will fill out over time they're messy to work and tricky to work with and uh you know typically uh you know you don't know if they're fully dispersed in the fuel oil or not uh and you have to top off these these dosage tanks probably more frequently than like but when they're using soluble atx well this uh, uh, the magnesium in ATX is a lot easier to dose. It can be delivered in bulk, um, and it is it is very much a step up from the messy magnesium slurry product options that the industry used to have to settle with. Now again, remember we said magnesium oxide slurries; they are just suspensions of particles. They do not dissolve in the fuel. So we rely on being, being able to keep them in suspension so that they will be delivered at the right ratio into the furnace. But the problem is that if, you, if you've got, by the nature of what slurries are, it is really difficult to know if a slurry is actually properly distributed through the oil. And that means that you never, if you're a magnesium oxide user, never actually know if you're getting the proper amount of, of slurry at any one particular time because you really have no way to know what the distribution is. Uh, these ATX with the oil soluble magnesium have do not have this problem because the ATX dissolves seamlessly. Fuel oil. It gets properly dispersed in there and it becomes part of that fuel oil. They do not need to worry about uh, uh, any kind of fallout, any kind of, of, of incomplete mixing or, or incomplete uh, dispersion in that fuel oil. It's a much more advantageous position for the fuel oil user using ATX. And of course, the results are much more advantageous. Uh, this customer used slurry. Magnesium slurry, they still have these magnesium deposits. And customers switched to ATX over a multiple month period of time. You can see those tubes a lot more like their support. Same here. This is what they got when they were using a slurry, all these deposits. Same customer switched to ATX. Tubes look a lot more like uh, what they're supposed to like. So, we hope that, you know, in, in this fairly detailed and in, in-depth discussion, we hope that the big takeaway here, uh, several things. First of all, um, for all of these problems, you know, when you're talking about corrosion, and you're talking about, uh, you know, deposit buildup inside the system, for all those kinds of problems, um, there are effective solutions out there. Um, but it's important to choose the right one. And we hope that we've been able to make a good case that the ATX family of fuel oil treatments with the oil soluble magnesium combined with the organometallic combustion improvers, um, we hope we've been able to show that they have some pretty distinct advantages that should be of interest to the HFO industry. So um, this really concludes our discussion about deposit and corrosion problems that heavy fuel oil users have to, uh, have to face. I hope that you're now more, a little bit more well versed with the advantages and the disadvantages of the different kinds of treatments. Ultimately, the choice for the industry, the choice for the heavy fuel oil using industry, comes down to 
oil soluble magnesium in treatments like ATX from Bell Performance versus the old school, messy, and relatively ineffective magnesium slurries that used to be available for that do not work as well and that have their problems and difficulties. Now, if you have any questions about this, uh, I've put my email on the screen, ebjornstead at bellperformance.net. I hope that if you have any questions, you'll drop me a line. Just say that you were watching the, the presentation on corrosion and deposit issues, you had some questions. I will be more than happy to do my best to answer your questions as best as I can. So that concludes our presentation discussion today on uh, corrosion and deposit problems with HFO users. I am Eric Bjornstad with Bell Performance, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.